Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Other Minds and Hands as we return to our holiday series here as we uh, we come back to the Christmas Carol, uh, which we talked about last year. I am joined by uh, by Maggie, and, and unfortunately by Maggie's cold today. <laughs> oh, it's new. I always have something, don't I? But yeah, I've got a little bit of a rough voice today, but I feel okay. Also, yeah. I'm laughing because the first comment in the Twitch is good afternoon, and you said good afternoon, <laughs> and we're about to talk about good afternoon and spirit. So good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. <laughs> well, fine, Corey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice to be here. Nice to talk about Christmas. I kept my festive background for such occasion. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. So last year we were looking at um, last year's examination of the Christmas Carol, which we did over two different sessions. We did one session on like old ones and one session on new ones, and. Um, it was um, it was a really neat moment of going through and, and trying to, you know, looking at the patterns of relationships between the books, uh, b between the book and the and the stories. Christmas Carol, of course, one thing I don't even know if we acknowledged this at the time. It's an interesting example because it's so short. Yeah. I mean, it's a very, very short book. In other words, it is a it is a length of story, which is actually better suited to a feature film adaptation than most novels are. There's uh, not a lot of cutting that needs to happen. It lends itself quite well to a format that will fit yeah. 26 minutes to 90 minutes. Yeah, I mean, like the novella or even, you know, a longish short story is kind of the quantity of plot you can do in a in a, yeah. in a feature film. Um, so it, it is one it is another thing that makes the the that makes a Christmas Carol I, in, in one way. It sort of um, one of the kind of confounding variables, right, um, is how much you have to cut, like the the amount of compression that's required in order to fit the um, to, to fit the original story, you know, some version of the original story uh, into this new shape, right into this new thing. And not only does that mean you know, place certain important restrictions or important uh, parameters on the adapted story. But it also means that different, like, you know, when different people approach that and, you know, the question of what are they going to cut and what are they not going to cut is going to be, you know, you have these huge differences available so that you can get, you know, different films that are quite significantly different because they're focusing on different elements of the story. Yeah. Um, and so, as I say, th these are the kinds of uh, confounding variables, as I say, that to some extent that larger works can can introduce. Um, similarly, the difference between larger uh, films. I, I mean, we, I know you were talking about this recently when we're looking at the difference between, for instance, with Pride and Prejudice, right? The single feature film versus the, um, you BBC. know, the, the multi-part thing where you just have more scope, where you have more space. Um, so, yes, in some ways... Christmas Carol helps to choosing a short work like the Christmas Carol to look at adaptations of enables us to focus. I don't. Know, I want to say almost more purely on the decisions that they might, you know, because those big decisions you don't have to. You're not pushed to those big decisions uh, and, just as, as much. And I love that we're looking at this one for similar reasons. That because there isn't that same conversation about compression, we get to look at some other mm -hmm. elements. And I, I really enjoyed last year where we looked at six or eight I think different it was six adaptations total, yeah. of this because we yeah. did two episodes and I think yep. there was three per episode. Yeah. Um, and we got to look at, you know, Doctor Who and Spirited and, you know, all Muppets and all these wonderful different reiterations of it. So it's been fun to look at that broad scope of the story. And then now we're going to be looking in at the openings, which follows our, our previous series, but like zeroing in on that focus so you do get to look at that and then we we're just talking about what we're going to do next week and we think we'll look at a specific moment in these versions so we can really zero in so i love that we've kind of gone this like full circle of let's take a look at this as a case study of six different adaptations really broadly you know top surface type stuff yes and then we get to dig down a little bit more which is good fun absolutely absolutely so yeah, so um, uh, so again, the three films we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about the classic 1951 Scrooge film. Um, Alistair Sim, I believe, was... Alistair Sim, Scrooge. yeah. And that's isn't that the one where like he 
puts Tiny Tim on his shoulder at the end, and that's like the that iconic image, which is made I into think so, yeah. Like and the, it was on the cover of the DVD for everything else, yeah. and now has been used over and over and over again. And it was uh, was used as like the trophy image in Scrooge. Remember when he gets this trophy yeah. that he chucks away in the in the thing? It's got that image on it, right? Of oh, I forgot that. Yeah, I forgot that. Yeah, yeah. there were like uh-huh. oh, those references. Anyway, I was because uh, yeah, I watched them back to back last year, so I was I was I was you struck by it. I was I, I was in there. I was getting it. Um, <laughs> But um, anyway, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the 1951 Scrooge film. We're going to talk about the Muppet Christmas Carol, and we're going to talk about Spirited. And I still the, argue that Muppet Christmas Carol is the only adaptation that ever needs to be considered. However, <laughs> right, I know. I'm, I'm excited to talk about the others. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's so it's it's an interesting um, the the kind of spectrum that we have there. It's not only interesting spectrum in time, 1951. Um, what was Muppets 90 something? 92, okay. 92, 94. In that range. And then Spirited, which was like two last years year. ago or something. Last year, yeah. 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 So um, so th- we have them set apart significantly in time. That's one interesting uh, element. Another is that they form an interesting spectrum in terms of what sort of adaptation they are, right? Um, we have the straight up retelling adaptation just attempting to depict the story, uh, you know, in film, um, uh, in the 1951 version. The Muppets version is also doing mostly a straight-up, but not entirely a straight-up But a little tongue-in-cheek. Right. There's a few added yeah. things, like hula skirts and tiki torches, but, you know, right. we look past that. Right, exactly. But not to mention really the overall element of Muppet casting, right, as yeah. well, which... Uh, which um, lends this sort of secondary text right to it like that um that is to say like when Fozzie the bear is cast as someone there's this overlay right um uh, uh just as there is the overlay with gonzo as dickens uh from the beginning so anyway like so it's it's obviously but but nevertheless like within those framework with 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 some of the extra bits um which are told from a modern perspective right like Rizzo the Rat is our representative as like modern audience, essentially, you know, yeah. um, relating to the um, to the to the dick. Anyway, so and then you've got Spirited, which is um, an entire, uh, you know, very different, you know, which is a, a, a full blown kind of, uh, you know, modulation, um, you know, it, interacting with the original, but not yeah. attempting to depict the original. Um Okay, so with these four, then let's look at opening. So let's start as we've been doing with the opening of the text. Yeah, let's start with the words. Yes, okay. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Then we have the delightful uh, digression. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade, but the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. By the way, you can tell like this paragraph shows really clearly how he like this was a work that was written for public performance right yeah um the you can hear it the 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 character of the narrator's voice is very much more forceful interjecting like that talking you know making comments of this kind um it's it's uh, it's not like night and day from all of Dickens' other narrators, but it's very it's very uh, uh, pronounced. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, and his his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral, and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. 
The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. If we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable about his taking a stroll at night in an easterly wind upon his own ramparts than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot, say St. Paul's Churchyard, for instance, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Okay, more digressions. <laughs> right. Quite the digression on that um, one. So... The emphasis is on Marley's death at the beginning, with the imp with the hints at supernatural stuff coming later, right? Like if you know, it must be understood that Marley was very definitely dead, and the certification of his death, and who signed the death certificate, and everything, right? Um, hinting that some, uh, you know, ghostly things are going to be happening later on in the story, right? Um, we move on from here to some comments about Scrooge, right? Uh, it transitions from Marley's, Marley's death to Scrooge, right? Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, and made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head and on his eyebrows and, and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his, his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. So there's our introduction to Scrooge. Right. Um, I love that, that whole bit. You just feel like you don't read stuff like that anymore in character description. A frosty rhyme was upon his head and on his eyebrow and a wiry chin. Carried his own low temperature always about with him. Mm -hmm. Like, that, that's such a great descriptor. Yes. If yes. I read that in the script now, I'd be like, fresh, amazing, <laughs> but it's a hundred something. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, I love what they're doing, what he does here with the connection between Scrooge and the cold, right? This is going to be a winter story. It's going to be a Christmas story, right? So, um, but his emphasis is on the cold within him froze his old yeah. features, right? So there is a cold within him and it has had an impact on him. His description, how he's described is an expression of that cold. As you say, like his, his white hair and beard, and you were told he has a white hair and beard, but it's characterized as frost, which is like spontaneously, um, uh, which is, an, is spontaneously emerging from, from with, as, as an expression of this cold uh, that, is, that is within him. Uh, as you say, carries it around always with him. Um, and doesn't thaw at one degree at Christmas, like tying it into the time frame too. Like it doesn't matter that it's Christmas, he's not going to get warmer. Yes. Though it's interesting that that's the first reference to Christmas since the title, right? Yeah. Um, the first moves that Dickens makes are first to establish the death of Marley and thereby hint at the ghostly creep, you know, spooky story that's coming up later on. Um, emphasizing death and emphasizing that, like, there might be some doubt about the death, right, is, uh, you know, or, you know, readers might have some doubt, and so they must put those doubts aside. Um, that's the first move that Dickens makes. And the second move that Dickens makes, well, okay, yeah, the second move that, that Dickens makes is to introduce Scrooge. Um, and to focus on his character. And it's all about that coldness. Coldness, which is presented in the context of squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Um, his stinginess, his, um, uh, his hard and sharp as flint, um, his, you know, well, unfriendliness as well, um, self-contained and solitary as an oyster. Um, that's the it's the it's it's in the context of that stuff that we're told about this cold that is within him right um you know i think about um <laughs> i can't help but think in part because i read it recently <clears throat> the um the concept that c.s lewis 
puts in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, right? Always winter and never Christmas. Mm. Like the way that Lewis kind of identifies those two things which are associated together, winter and Christmas, right? And you've got all the coldness and harshness and, you know, unliveliness of and oppression of winter. But you have this oasis of, like, warmth and festivity and happiness and friendliness uh, that is Christmas, right, in the middle of it. And so emphasizing that it's always winter but never Christmas is a way that, you know, Lewis does of emphasizing how, like, what the nature of the witch's curse is uh, on Narnia here. You can see, once again, there's, like, the coldness of winter, right, and there is the warmth of Christmas. And... Emphasizing the coldness, associating him with that wintry coldness, um, but again, but distancing him from winter. Right? There's a sense it's always winter and never Christmas, and Scrooge is right, counting those so two. Yeah, um, and but it's important, I think, to mention, especially in the context of some of what we're going to see in the adaptations. Um, it's important to mention that he doesn't start with an emphasis on Christmas. Mm-hmm. Right. He does. We're not we don't begin with like the warmth of Christmas and then show Scrooge to be a deviating from that. Right. Like a very. No, and, from from, and from the start, this doesn't feel like a Christmas story. This mm-hmm. is a grisly, grim, old man. Yes. Yes. This happens to be at Christmas time, but it's not really a Christmas story. Yeah. And we don't even know. Like, you know, I mean, he, he mentions Christmas, but he mentions Christmas in the same sentence that he talks about the dog days of summer. Right. So it's mentioned as a season. Right. And as a season that doesn't affect him, but neither does summertime. Right. Neither heat nor cold uh, affects Scrooge. So we still haven't actually been told that it's Christmas time. Right. Yet. right. right. Um, there. So I get it's it's you know, it's been name dropped there in that paragraph. But we don't even we don't even know. Um, oh man, I love that sentence. I remember talking about this last year too. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. Um, right? Oh, so good. So, so good. So good. So no poetic. pelting rain less open to entreaty. Um, I was just having a conversation about descriptions of a friend about, it was about like the stereotypical way women are described and it's always about how uh, she was pretty but she didn't know it. You know, right. she, all these like, attraction physical attributes and how tiring that is because it doesn't actually tell you anything about the character mm-hmm. and then you read something like this and you're like wow that tells me exactly what kind of person this is and it doesn't matter who i cast because it doesn't rely on looks like this is all about the steely cold yeah persona that they're able to embody and it's very cool yeah yeah okay so so the where uh, i should i should add because, you know, it's something that came up such that we were commenting on it while I was reading it through. Um, a third element that is very, very prominent in the beginning is the voice of the narrator, right? All those interruptions and digressions. Um, yeah. The Hamlet digression, the dead is a doornail digression, right? I mean, of the, we get essentially, you know, two out of the first four paragraphs are that kind of chatty narrator voice aside, right? So... That strikes me. This is clearly an important choice, right? We are, we are meant to be aware of the fact that we are listening to a storyteller yeah. um, tell us a story. We're, there's, there's a kind of, um, we're not just being dropped into and drawn into the story. We're focused on the teller, on the first person character who is telling us this story. Um, and that, I think, is, that seems to be important. I mean, Dickens seemed to think it important. He uh, he did emphasize that. And of course, as I said, as we know, he did also go around doing stage performances uh, of, of this. So he was very aware, whether he wrote it specifically for the stage or whether that was just a thing that kind of came about after he had written it, I, I don't know enough about Dickens' history to know that. Um, but... Um, one way or the other, um, that is clearly uh, a, a critical element of the story as it's as it's presented. What do you make of the title? I'm sure we talked about this last year, but towards revisiting, like, 
There's no way to separate it from a Christmas story. And now we say a Christmas Carol, this is all any of us know. But when this first came out, it did not have that connotation because this made the connotation. So yeah. what do you think that reference is to Fantasy I, Well, Carol? I mean, Christmas Carol, I mean, uh, the idea of... Um, so caroling... It's obviously, Christmas carols are songs, right? But within English culture, and this features in several of the film adaptations, that is like the groups of people going around singing songs, right? Like mm -hmm. at people's doorways and stuff. Um, that's a, a thing. Like that's a cultural phenomenon, right? To go around and sing carols at people's doors. Um, and what was plainly done in the 19th century so when it's when the story is called a Christmas Carol, it not only associates the story with the songs that are sung, but I think that sort of occasion of telling it, right? In my mind, it's like the, the again the narrator that narrator voice, basically putting himself in the position of like, I am knocking on your door and here to like, you know, relay this story to you, just like. A Christmas Caroler would be knocking on your door and coming to sing, to sing these songs. Um, but uh, anyway, so I, that, but it is, it is interesting, in that, a lot of the Christmas it's associated with music then in that sense, mm -hmm. right? But not, but that doesn't ref, like show up that much. No. I mean, the connection between. I mean, of the the films we're looking at, two out of the three of them are actually musicals, right? Um, so that's a connection that many of the adaptations choose to really dwell on, right? Um, but it does not seem to be the way in which the original was uh, was sort of capitalizing exactly. on that connection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just thought it was an interesting choice, you know? Like, it could have been called Scrooge. It's mm -hmm. even called Marley, but right. a Christmas Carol. It's it seems quite different from what this introduction shows us. Yeah, yeah, um, yes. Um, the other interesting thing, I don't think. Again, like I've never really been part of like the Christmas caroling culture, you know. Um, but normally, it's groups of people, like. One person knocking on your door to sing a song is weird. Like, that would be weird. Wouldn't that be weird? I think that would be weird. As far as yeah. I know, that would be weird. Um, and so, I don't know. I don't know. Thinking of this as a Christmas carol, is there some sort of invitation? I, I don't know. I gotta say, it is, a, it is a peculiar metaphor. All I can think of is that that relationship. That, like, you know, I am come to you in this holiday season to tell you a story. Right. Like yeah. carolers might show up at your door, you know, and sing Christmas carols. Um, but I know yeah, so much of it is almost attached to the Keynesian Victorian type, you know, like mm -hmm. so many competent switch, like you wear those that clothing and it's a performance to go caroling in Victorian dress. Yes. And yes. It's now attached to Christmas carol. Yeah. Well, OK, so that's actually really interesting. Um uh, and yes, Gregory, the, the, um, yeah, hang on a second. The full title, the full title of Christmas Carol in prose. Yeah, it might be. At least since, yes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, anyway, I, I was focused on what JJ was just saying. Um, is it sort of like the several ghosts showing up at Scrooge's home? Um, Yes, and I think this is one of the reasons why The Knocker is such an important play, right? We, you know, the Arthur Rackham image at the top of stave one here is, um, uh, is not, and by the way, they're called stave one, right? This is the first verse of the carol. So right. there is a deliberate attempt to, to, to parallel the book to a Christmas carol that would be sung, right? But I'm focused on the kind of invitation that seems oh, to be implicit story. in it, yeah. right? 
that we're to go on and share this story. Like we're supposed to be caroling, you know, sharing this story with others like uh, you do with Christmas carols, right? Again, you don't, you don't sit and sing or listen to Christmas carols by yourself. That's not the point, right? right? Um, Some of us do, but yeah. Well, I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying that's not the culture, right? Um, That's not caroling. That's listening to carols. Right, exactly. And similarly, um, uh, as JJ was saying, Scrooge has people show up. You know, they're not knocking on the door. Instead, the door knocker itself transforms. Normally, carolers would come and they would knock your your door knocker, right? And then they would sing at your door. Um, in this book, the door knocker itself becomes the in the beginning of the intrusion, right? Um, and then it's not only Marley's ghosts ghost, but then the the other ghosts um, that show up and intrude themselves upon him. Um, and so I think there is a kind of parallel with that sort of caroling situation. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. And no, I, I digress, but I just thought it was interesting. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. I think it is. Um, okay, so let's think through the adaptations now. In the 1951 Scrooge adaptation. Um, it starts with the same, well, it starts with the book. Again, the opening it's, credits, you know, we're and opening the book. it shows us text. We're zooming into pages. We see stave one, very yeah. text. It looks very text focused. Can I point out a really small detail I noticed that really jumped out at me? Yeah. The book is put down in front of the camera, the Christmas Carol, right? And then a hand reaches over and opens the book. And it sh- and it says like with Alistair Sim, right? You know, the, the, announcing the act. So it start it starts the credits off with the 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 main the 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 lead actor. But the hand, it was the hand that struck me, because the hand came in, it comes in from the side, and it's so the book's in front of you, and it's someone's right hand coming in and pulling the cover towards them. That is the body that would have to be behind that arm is on the other side of you. It was almost every time I've ever seen a book on screen, a, it's being turned from the viewer's yeah. perspective, right? Yeah. A hand reaches up from the bottom, usually the left hand, but sometimes the right. But in any case, it's it's the point of view of the body. It's inviting us to be like, you. imagine you are the one turning the pages of this book, uh-huh. right? I, I can't even think of an example of a book I've seen on screen where that is not what's happening. Even when you get, like, comical plays on this, like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, when, like, the gorilla hand comes and grabs the, the, still... the lady's hand. They're still, I mean, and then the gorilla's yeah. turning it, right? So you turn from, like, the lady with the painted nails to the gorilla, but it's still playing with that same thing this hand comes in on the other side so the person holding is standing across from you or not even across but like off to the side so it's like they're telling you the story yes yeah they 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 present the book to you and then they turn it for us to read it's face towards us like it's not face towards them it's face towards us but this other person and there's this sense of like it's definitely being shared with me, you know, given to me and and presented to me by somebody else rather than uh, just like imitating the reading experience um, on on my own. I was it was, it was a really really small detail, but I was it was no, that's great. I mean, that's, again, a little filmic thing of like, oh, I didn't even notice that, but that's such a great way to be like, I'm presenting a story to you. Yeah, it's not you sitting down and reading it. It's here. Let me tell you. Yeah, and the nice and, little. Like when the hand reaches over, it reaches over and grabs the middle of the hardback cover and pulls it towards him. It's like not like opening a book. So it was like opening a box, basically. I mean, like the, 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 the hand gesture, the hand and arm gesture was nothing I would ever associate with opening a book. You know, it just yeah. wasn't holding it like a book. It wasn't moving it like a book. It was even if you were imagining holding a book upside down to yourself so that someone else could read it and turning the pages, you'd do it on the top. You wouldn't reach yeah. across the middle and do that. No. Right. Um, huh. Again, like 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 opening a box. Uh, it was it was uh, I was I, I don't know. When I was focused on that scene, I was I found that really striking. But it seemed to love, me to I love that you're starting to look at things filmically. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I didn't talk that well <laughs> And it and I, I was reminded of it when thinking about the the narrator voice um, in 
Dickens, right? That it's, um, yeah. and of course, then the first thing that we get is a narrative voiceover. Yes. Um, so in, for, in both of those ways, both of the, the way that the opening book images are presented in order to give the sense of somebody else is showing you this book. And this is not just a, a, a sort of illusory private experience of you reading this book, right? Um, there's, there's definitely a, a, a second person <laughs> there in the, in the equation with you. Um, then you hear the voiceover, right? So, so you're getting, you're getting a definite narrator's voice as well, which returns, um, uh, which returns fairly quickly um, uh, as the as the scene as the opening scene progresses there, um, but uh, anyhow, um, then we then we 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 get the opening line: Marley was dead to begin with, um, but it shifts almost immediately. Um, they include, they kept the hint of ghostly activities, right? Um, that is, it, uh, uh, let's see, uh, where were, um, that this must be distinctly understood for nothing wonderful can come of the story that I'm going, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. So, like, they, 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 they tack that on, but then they immediately segue to Scrooge. Yeah. Um, in fact, they immediately did that thing that I always find really interesting and slightly vexing, but also really interesting when people do, when adapters take a line from the book, like they lift a line verbatim from the book, but they either give it to a different character or they put it in a completely different context or they even change the meaning of it completely, but they've anchored it in the book, Right. And that always, like, whenever I know a book well enough to recognize a quotation like that and yeah. recognize that it's at a place. I mean, so obviously this was happening to me a lot in the Peter. Well, not a lot, but it happened. It happens several times in the Peter Jackson films um, uh, with different effects and in the Hobbit films uh, also. Yeah. Um, but they did that here, too. Um, Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to is the line I'm mm -hmm. thinking of. They quote that. It's like the third line of the thing. But they use it as like the introduction to Scrooge. And they use it to show to as if the sentence were referring just to his financial reputation. Like they yeah. he's in the exchange, right? We see him there uh, with other men of business, right? And he walks across, uh, he walks past, and these other men of business greet him uh, and uh, treat him with obvious, uh, with obvious respect, right? Yeah. Um, Your servant, sir, uh, Mr. Scrooge. Yeah, there's very much a deferential behavior towards him. Exactly, exactly. So, of course, that line is, in the original work, is a way of certifying the death of Marley, right? It's just part of proving that, uh, you. how do you know Marley's dead? Because Scrooge signed the register of his burial, right? Yeah. And Scrooge's name was good for anything, was was good upon change for anything he chose to put his mind his, his hand to, right? Like that's that's uh, um, that's how you know that Marley's dead. And instead, they just they shift it and focus on it um, to um, uh, to be establishing his reputation. And it was odd because Scrooge seems quite friendly with the people there, right? The, the, as you say, the, the deferential, yeah. the respect with which they treat him and everything. I mean, yeah. he's not friendly. He's not acting nice towards them. They're not, you know, it, it doesn't seem like they're going to go get a beer or something like that, right? I mean, it's not that kind of... Uh, that. But yet, showing him in a kind of social context at the beginning yeah. seemed to me a really striking uh, ch uh, change. There's, there's something they're doing there, right? Well, and, they're, and they all seem to be the same to a certain extent there. So they're all co-workers, I'm on the exchange. Oh, you're heading off early. Are you off to celebrate Christmas? They don't know anything about each other if that's yeah. what they're asking Scrooge, yeah. right? They're just like, oh, it's Christmas Day. This guy's leaving early. Must be. So they're all kind of starting on this equal. So 
yeah. having him separate himself out from that is our first little nod of like, hmm, he's not quite part of the same crowd that they seem to be, but they don't know anything about him. It's this impersonal relationship of work colleagues. Yes. Yes, it's true. But even that is way more than we're given of Scrooge in the book, right? Yeah. Where the emphasis is on his graspingness, right? Which we don't even know yet about Scrooge. All we know is that these men who are talking to him defer to him and respect him. He's not particularly intimate with them, and he doesn't celebrate Christmas, right? right. That's that's all we know about him. Um, we don't find out that he's squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, and covetous. We don't find out that he's solitary as an oyster. Indeed, he's not solitary as an oyster at the beginning. And not particularly congenial, but not solitary. Um, you know, and he's also quite poetic. You know, he's got that line about the nature of things and uh, the ants toil and grasshoppers sing. Yes. Like, that's not the Scrooge we met in the text. Yes. And he, I mean, he has a cynical attitude, but yes, it's expressed rather poetically there. Yeah. 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 It's not icy demeanor that lowers the temperature. Right. It does not look, I mean, I don't know. Do you think they were going for a little bit of temperature lowering in the sense that like the other two guys are really like upbeat and cheerful and congenial, but Scrooge is a buzzkill. Is, yeah, it's a buzzkill kind of coming yeah. through. I don't know. If they were going for that, it didn't succeed, I don't think. Because yeah, I, mean, I guess it's a different way to try to lower the temperature, but it does just kind of feel like it's a slightly different character that they're portraying. He's still rude. He's still business-focused. But it is a slightly different first image that I think we get from the text. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, because, like, when he leaves... The, we see the two other the two other guys still on screen for a second after he walks off, and they don't look chilled. Like it doesn't look like he's, you know, frozen the room and they, you know, all the fun they were having is now gone. Um, I mean, again, he's clearly not part of it, and he separates himself from it. Um, but uh, but yeah, there, there's very little of that impact. And then of course the 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 next follow up, right? I don't want to go too deep into the film, but uh, could just just focusing on the opening. We then see him go down. Th now we, we see him step outside, and there's snow, right? So we do get we're the, yeah. And we're still in the opening building, so that's still the same. But right. yeah, they step outside. It's snow. We know it's cold. He's coming down the steps, the steps and is met on the steps by one of his debtors, right? And not even met. The guy's been waiting there. Like yeah. he's he's on the top step, waiting for Scrooge to step out. Yes. Yes. And he's asking for more time. And Scrooge is, this is where we begin to see, um, you know, squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, yeah. covetous, right? Um, his impatience and intolerance for the idea of giving him a, an extension on the loan. Um, uh and there's like the hard edge of I can't I'm looking at the script I can't pay you you know I need more time did I give you more time but then it cuts straight to I can't take my wife to debtor's prison and then leave her behind yes you know that yes. juxtaposition of but I can't do this to her well then don't leave her behind. like it's such a cold rebuttal and quick yes and to me that was the first moment we see like ooh you're a real jerk huh right right and the thing that they are showing uh, the, the the guy, the debtor, is trying to make a personal appeal to Scrooge's empathy and compassion, right? Um, and we can see the uh, how thoroughly that appeal fails, right? There's no... Uh, no chance of that one. It doesn't register, even, it seems, with Scrooge. Even the, even the, the way that he replies with logic, right? When the guy asks for more time, he says, did I ask for more time when you ask me for the loan, um, then why should I grant you more time to pay it back? Right. Um, uh, you know, the, yes, there's there's a logic to that response, right? But, um, uh, but a logic which utterly ignores the context of the situation, right? Of course, 
giving a loan and paying back a loan are not exactly the same thing, right? Um, but um, but even there, what they seem to be emphasizing primarily is his distance from human experience, his distance yeah. from human emotion, right? And complete lack of interest in engaging with it. Yes, yes. Um, so as I, I, I was saying that to some extent, I keep quoting this because it's the very first sentence that we get about Scrooge. He was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, squeezing, wrenching, grasping, right? Um, but that's not what we're seeing here. Yeah. Um, it's This is not like, I want more money, I refuse to relent. He's just completely unsympathetic to, yeah. you know, the human circumstances of this other person. Um it's his distance from humanity that the film seems to emphasize there. Yeah. And it's associated with cold because they're standing in the snow, right? Um, but there's not that same sense of carrying his, temp you know, uh, carrying his low temperature about with him exactly. Um, again, we see him being a jerk, but it is primarily insensitivity and jerkiness, not covetousness, not and the staging of, And the staging of that scene, too. I mean, he's on the top step. This guy is waiting small and meek below him. So there's this power dynamic that's yeah. kind of played out on that staircase really strongly. And the guy's tiny. Yes. The, the debtor. Yeah, um, even when they get to even ground, he's still... And, and his body posture, yeah. he's crouched down and Scrooge is standing perfectly rigid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, this, this seems to me important because I think that in both of those opening sequences, both the conversation with the two other guys in the, in the exchange and the debtor who meets him on the stairs... They are presenting Scrooge. They're foregrounding Scrooge's relationship with people. And how he treats other people. And that's, of course, that's that's there in the text. That's important in the text. But it isn't where Dickens begins. He begins described with the frostiness, right? He begins with this solitary portrait of Scrooge before he even brings us to show. And when we see Scrooge interact with people in the book, we see him doing similar things. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying that what they're doing in the film there is alien to the text. It's just interesting in the context of like the opening stuff that we've been doing, that that's not where Dickens chooses to begin. The, one of the big things that stuck out to me here that we'll get to when we talk to Spirited is the three mentions of good afternoon that are in here. <laughs> yes. And, just, and like now it has a different context because I've watched Spirited, but not that different. Like when you watch this version, the way he says good afternoon really does feel... The dismissiveness, yeah. The absolute good afternoon does feel like a curse word. Yes. Um, so having that kind of planted in in the 1951... And now we're seeing so many elements of this, like you're saying, the tiny tip up on the shoulder and the ghost of, uh, Chris, of future yet to come. Those iconic things that by the time we get dispirited, we don't need any of this other explanation because we all know it so well. It's just like this tiny little image and we can pull up all this other stuff. So having that tiny little signpost and good afternoon was such a good one to like pull through and be like, this is how we phrase this. So I don't know, I can just picture Ryan Reynolds and Will Ferrell watching this this version and picking that out and being like, I got a song. Right, right. No, it is really it is really funny. Um and yeah. I I, ha I almost have to think. Um I mean, it's just something that we've talked about before. Um like what you know, that we were talking about when we were talking about the Bakshi and the Peter Jackson adaptation, right? That uh, of the Lord of the Rings. Um that um it's easy to forget when we think about adaptations. It's it's so tempting to look at a a modern adaptation of a work that's been adapted before 
and think about its relationship with the text as if it were a solitary relationship between right. it and the text when much of the time the filmmaker seems to be thinking even more about its relationship to the other films than it is about thinking about. So, so yes, uh, like the Good Afternoon thing, I would absolutely believe that the Good Afternoon thing in Spirited is a direct reference to this film rather yeah. than to uh, uh, rather than to, to to anything in the book itself explicitly. And that's what's yeah. That, I think that's one of the things I love so much about adaptation is that like there's so much that a story relies on, a modern retelling story relies on, not just the original source because there's so much between that, and it's not just like oh, there's five different versions of Little Women or there's six different versions mm-hmm. of Christmas Carol. It's all the merchandise. It's all the songs. It's all the mm-hmm. families gathering around. It's all the book covers. It's the calendars. Like all this other stuff. And you think about it with a little different art that came out, um, and the different artists that were then incorporated into the filmmaking as con- conceptual artists, pulling all of that kind of like institutional knowledge mm-hmm. into an adaptation and being aware of the references that your audience is going to have. Uh, it, it's really clever, you know, it's yeah. a really nice way to honor the text that came before and be aware of what's going to affect it. Taking that phrase and turning it into a song, really clever, really creative. It is, <laughs> it is really it. clever. Yeah, yeah. So let me say, we'll make one last point here. At the risk of seeming to strain this one observation too far, but again, in the context of openings, um, I'm not asserting this necessarily about the whole film, but I'm saying as far as the opening is concerned, there seems to me to be um, uh, the way that in which the film focuses on his human relationships, right? Um, the Where they seem to be establishing Scrooge's character, that's where our attention is drawn. Like, what, Scro- what makes Scrooge bad that he needs to change is how he treats people. Right? That's what, I, that's what, that's, that's what I'm getting from these opening sequences with Scrooge. Yeah. In the book... That's not the emphasis. Uh, again, it's not that he doesn't emphasize that element, but that's not what we get introduced to. The very first thing we're told about him is that he is a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. Is this about how he treats people? Yes, indirectly. But it's primarily about his covetous... He's a covetous old sinner. Right? And you know, like the, the one that's, that's jumping to mind as being the closest to that line is Mickey's Christmas Carol, mm-hmm. where Ebenezer Scrooge, Scrooge McDuck... Um, says that Marley left him money for his gravestone. He said, ah, oh, and I had a bird at sea. Like, that <laughs> speaks to that. There are these yes. little moments of, yes. you know, tight-fisted coming the funds. Yes. Yeah, but you don't, you don't necessarily get that in these. So, what's yeah. Making? No, yeah. exactly. I mean, it, and I do think that it's a significant difference. I do think, in fact, I even, pushing my one observation even further, I wonder if it's even points to a difference between a 19th and 20th century sensibility as the 1951 film is a hundred years later, right. than the original book, um, that what needs to change in Scrooge is his, like he's a miser. He is, it's his attitude towards money, which is the root problem that he has. And if that changes, other things are going to change too. Right. Um, he needs to decide that there are other th- like humans, human relationships are important and the ghosts are going to show him lots of things about his human relationships that need improvement. Right. Um, but this is like held out as something he should be choosing instead of money. Right. Yeah. Which means his relationship with money, that's the core problem. Whereas, again, the film is not setting me up for that. The, mo- the film is setting me up for he's a jerk. He's a jerk to other people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's his problem. Right. Um, and that's the thing that needs to change. Um, and the money is like the context in which he's a jerk to people. Yeah. Right. Um, so anyway, I, like I said, I, I don't want to, I don't want to push it. I don't want to push that too far, but this is, um, I think of, uh, you know, all the conversations we've had about, um, the question of being faithful to an adaptation, like nobody would say, I think nobody would say that the opening of that is not faithful to the book. Like they're being, they're doing a faithful adaptation. They're doing yeah. things that are in the book. And yet, even when you're doing things, you can still, I think that it's an interesting idea of uh, an actually a truly fundamental change that 
is being at least pointed to or hinted at in that opening scene, despite the fact that they're being quite faithful, uh, you know, quite, quite close in their adaptation of the story. Um, but let's talk about the Muppets. Let's bring it. <laughs> With the Muppets. Um, the number one thing, the obvious difference, right? Think about where we start. From narrative, first yeah. of all. Yeah. Well, we get the opening sequence. The opening sequence, instead of being the book, right? With the hair at hand weirdly opening the book. Instead of getting the book, we get the roofs. Flying of, over the yeah. roofs of London. We're flying over the roofs of London, which looks lovely. Right. Both are like both are ways to enter a story, though. You know, like mm -hmm. with 1951, they zoomed in so far on the actual page that you could see like the fibers of the paper. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they were pushing you into it. Yeah, this kind of felt similar. And I was actually thinking about the Grinch that we were talking about the week before, how we have that drone shot of the Benedict Cumberbatch um, Grinch, and we're skiing with the birds. Yes, and so we're part of it coming into Whoville. And I kind of feel that way with the Muppet one. We're flying over the roofs ourselves and joining the story. Yeah. And then we're welcomed by Charles Dickens Gonzo. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, of course, we get a whole musical number yeah. before we meet Scrooge. Okay. Right? Um, we get the whole um, It Feels Like Christmas song at the beginning. That, like, everybody yeah. in... The, so, like, we open the film by being introduced... To everyone, to like everybody, like to the whole culture. The setting. We're, it's, yeah. It's we're like immersed all in the, the other setting. Ones, like it gives you that establishing shot. Like it's showing you where we are. Yeah. And the the spirit of the establishment shot is the community, right? Yeah. I mean, like everybody together singing together about um, the things that, you know, make it feel like Christmas basically right is the premise of the song um and it's a are you thinking of no that's the crew that goes to christmas present that comes later no there's i the, isn't that it feels like christmas song isn't that the it's one like, it's in the uh, street corner choir that's the that ghost one. of christmas present i don't so know that's... i think that i think they're playing it at the beginning Are i was it? i yeah i was just watching it let me see so all i can think of is the when the cold wind blows, it chills you, chills you to the bone, and it's all about Scrooge. That's the second one. When 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 Scrooge and comes in, yeah. But there's the whole there's the whole other before you meet Gonzo this Dickens. Is what happens? This is what happens when I rely on my memory because I've seen it a million times. Right. Um. Hang on a second. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry, I'm like totally calling it up on my phone here. So here we go. Do it, do it. <laughs> um, I'm like, because all I can hear is no cheese is for us, me says. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. How could that happen? I know how it happen? could happen. Sorry, sorry, that just clocked. <laughs> that happen. I know how it could happen. <laughs> the, I think the music of that is being played behind the credits. Yeah. The, oh yes, the music is playing. Yes, the opening. That's credits why I'm is, thinking of that song first, and why I'm thinking the of the opening, Scrooge song as the second song. And the opening credits is that song. The overture is that song, but it's also a mix of some of the other songs. You definitely mm -hmm. get that music first, but then it mixes in with the other songs. But I think our first actual song is Scrooge. Yes, is the Scrooge song. Yes. yes. But before we actually get the Scrooge song, we get talking vegetables and humor from Rizzo and, you know, all these other things that are just a totally very different from the Dickens version. Right. But what they emphasize really firmly is the narrator context again, yeah. right? It's the Muppet version, which more than any other that I know of, um, leans heavily on the narrator's voice and even has a similar kind of spirit to um, the narrator and Dickens' actual narrator who keeps digressing and interrupting the story, right? Yeah. 
just as Gonzo keeps interrupting the story in order to tell us, you know, more of the story, but it, and to, to assert and, on himself. And yeah. Rizzo digresses even farther, you know? So, like, you'll have Gonzo interrupting, but then you'll have Rizzo taking us, you know, off into the netherworld. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm on Moto. I wasn't remark uh, wondering how it could happen that I could possibly be wrong. I was how I could it be wrong? I was wrong about this because I just watched it literally half an hour ago. So like well, that, that's that was the thing that yeah. I had the same reaction of Emoto when it took me a minute for that to fall and be like, Corey <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna upset myself for a minute just to go blow my nose. I'll be right back. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um so yeah I do think that the that the narrator character the narrator character that the making of the uh the narrator character is such a focal point um even the the kind of back and forth with gonzo and rizzo um where rizzo is skeptical that he's charles dickens right um and uh uh you know so that we have this um even if all we had were the narrator on the screen, like if we had a Gonzo narrator on screen, that by itself would make the narrator figure really prominent. The fact that he's like, I am the narrator and my name is Charles Dickens. And then Rizzo is like, you're not Charles Dickens. And then he has to like sort of, um, uh, you know, prove that he is or something. Um, they're, I mean, they're going so far out of their way to draw attention to the storyteller thing, right? That it's, I, I think, very, very remarkable. But the other thing that, but then at the same time, they actually integrate the narrator into the story, yeah. right? That is, does, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Does that, does that happen with Dickens? I mean, I don't think so. I don't feel like the narrator no. is a character in Dickens I, when... No, I don't think he... But the, but the way that the narrator is integrated in the story with the Muppets is very muppet -y. Like It is. They're not actually integrated. They're only integrated when it's funny. <laughs> right. When they get knocked off by a window or... Well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Like, it's... it's. But even... <laughs> um, no, think of the... Remember the big lead -um that they do when they, he introduces Scrooge? And he's yeah. like, oh, who is he? He's coming. Like, when's he coming? He's coming now. <laughs> right now. And then he comes around the corner and then the song begins, right? Um, this shows, of course, uh, this implies, right, our narrator's authority over the story in some sense, yeah. right? And yet, he's like right there. Like, he's, yeah. he's, he's not, this is not a separate, like, we're not cutting from like a sitting room where the narrator is, you know, speaking in an armchair and then cut to the snowy, he's standing in the snowy streets of London with Rizzo the yeah. Rat. And he's like, and here's Scrooge. And he just, and he walks, they, they walk by. And then Rizzo is like, ooh, is it cold in here all of a sudden? Because yeah. Scrooge in the Muppet version does, does bring like his cold with him, right? And does freeze the room. I loved that, um, I that loved, they remembered I that. I hadn't clocked that like physical presence element either because even when they travel, they're hitching a ride to the ghosts. Like they are traveling physically with them. Yeah, so, so they're crawling up this, to look like, in windows and all that kind of thing. Yeah, there's never this like all narrator element that yeah. you see in stories. They know because they're watching. Yeah. Huh. So he is like both that. the narrator who is in one sense in control of the story, but he is also in this other sense as you say merely an observer um mm -hmm. and it's part of his world that he is looking at um so yeah it's it is a it is a very peculiar um but as they say enormously prominent narrator intervention like you know narrator perspective narrator character um in the muppet version it's just it's the number one thing I find again and again. Like it's 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 one of the things that makes that one stand out to me um, as much as anything. Like the voiceover in, you know, the Scrooge film can't have anything to that, you know. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. I think we can see this being played on in an interesting way in Spirited, but we'll get there in a minute. Um, the. 
in terms of adaptation too, it's just so fun to think about because I've, I've had this conversation like flippantly with a few friends of this is one of the best adaptations of Dickens' work for so many reasons and you get a laugh and it's like, no, really. Like, actually it is, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't actually matter that there's talking fruits and rats like in terms of story and structure and purpose, like it's all there. And I remember reading something about Michael Caine getting cast and he was like, I'm going to play it totally straight. Shakespearean style, totally straight gonna pretend as if nothing around me is a muppet and he does that you know mm -hmm. like he is interacting with everyone as if they are a shakespearean actor yes yes um and that is the effect of that is to maintain this to maintain a connection a kind of immediacy of the story which yeah. again which the the narrator thing would tend to distance me from, right? Um, no, but this brings you along with it, and it brings a super modern context into it. So you have, yeah, they're wearing Dickensian clothes, but they're they're not. They're very modern. You know, well, yeah, I mean, it's a cool. Muppet wearing Dickensian clothes, you know, most of the time. Right? <laughs> yeah. Or like a yeah, Muppet the, animal wearing Dickensian clothes. And they're making reference to modern things, you know, like... Yeah the the heat wave tiki outfit and the right. jelly beans and like all these things that are it's it, it's a lovely way to bring a modern audience into this because yeah. you know the muppets you're they're popular they have a tv show they're gonna pull you in and lean in to the dickens element yes. and be one of the closer adaptations we've seen yep yeah um yeah now let's <clears throat> uh before we move on let's talk about the scrooge song because the Scrooge, they introduce Scrooge, where we get this like really cool descriptive descriptive paragraph to introduce us to Scrooge. We get the Scrooge song, in the um, uh, we we get the Scrooge song in the uh, um, in the film. Uh, first of all, I know again. I noticed. I thought you were pausing for me to sing it, and I was about ready. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got that chills you to the bone, right? Mm -hmm. You get the so you get the reference to the cold, right? They're definitely cold playing blues. on the cold elements yeah. of that um, of that description. Um, but uh, what do you feel that they emphasize? What's the primary theme of that of that of that song? Because it seems to me, again, oh, like. Uh, risking generalizing from one thing that that again they're emphasizing just like that he's a jerk to people that he's a jerk to people and the whole community knows it yes like everyone's like there goes mr humbug there goes mr grinch yes first of all they reference grinch which is pretty great but everybody's aware of the crappiness of this guy where we didn't really get that in yes. the original yeah and the you're right really <laughs> huge emphasis on the community that's a big deal like when yeah. all of the community is breaking out into song together about and Scrooge hurting all of them whether they be the horses or the teasers for the nieces you know all the way from top to bottom he's yes. hurt them all yeah yeah exactly um yeah so yes everybody feels the same way about him it emphasizes his alienation from the community as a whole. And it's again, it's that community as a whole, the panning over the city and then the looking at the streets and seeing people interacting and everything leading up to, um, uh, w leading up to Dickens. Um, so we, we were contextualized in the community to begin with. And that then serves as the backbone for the, uh, the contrasting, um, yep. depiction of, of Scrooge. So yeah, in that way it's really it's going in a similar direction to the original Scrooge film but but stronger. Stronger yeah. by showing how everybody else is unified against him in that sense. But that gives it a really good foundation for the reveal which we'll talk about next time, but the reveal at the end, you know, we've seen his impact on the community and how they receive him. So to see every single character interact with him differently at the end shows a much bigger change than if you just mm -hmm. saw somebody by themselves in a room saying, I'm changed. Like, well, yes. sure, you think you are, but, right. you know, that, that interaction really kind of shows that. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, 
I um, excellent. Phil is quoting the line. Oh, Mr. Grimm. Right, Scroogey, Scroogey loves his money because he thinks it gives him power. If he becomes a flavor, you can bet he would be sour. Yes. Um, there is the reference to his greed uh, and his love of money. Um, but yeah. And every day in every way, Scrooge is getting worse is yeah. how the song ends. Like, there's no hope for this man. Like, he's... What's the word? What's the phrase that they use in, in uh, Spirited? Unredeemable? Something like right. that? Yeah. 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 Um, yes. And I, I, I was, I wasn't thinking, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking more about w the observation you were making. Cause I, I wasn't even really tracking with the fact, the whole community singing together. Right. And the way that that sets him at odds with everybody and the significance of that. This is of course a convention of musicals, right? Everybody bursting into song, right? Or like one random person on a street singing one line and another random person on the street who's not connected with them singing like the rhyming line or like, you know, finishing the couplet, right? The way in which it suggests like the, the implication, right? That the thing being expressed by this song is this like spontaneous expression of the community, right? right. Um, and, um, there are of course lots of ways in which musicals play on that, right? Um, uh, on that, on that sense. But, um, but I'm not going to get distracted by that. I do think that that's the, cause yeah, that, it is a really interesting element. Um, it's just an easy, not an easy way, because there's a lot involved in it, but it's a very simple, clear way to separate that person and, and have them be the other. Right. So if everyone's bursting in song and you're not, you stand out. Yeah. If everyone's bursting in song and that song is about how crap you are, right. you're really going to stand out as right. not a good guy. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the freight, like, I'll have to rewatch that for shots, but... I feel like most of the shots there are from the ground looking up at him. So he's very powerful and domineering and, and occupying most of the frame. And then that final shot is Scrooge is getting worse and he turns around and catches them singing about him and everybody scatters. And yes. there is that feeling of like, oh God, he got it. It's like there's an absolute fear of this guy and he is so other and separate. And also I might be wrong about this, but I think because you've taught me to pay attention to these things, that Scrooge is moving from right to left through a lot of that song. Now, pull it up again. <laughs> I think, I think, there, I, there are definitely a couple of scenes that I remember where he's moving from right to left. And am I YouTubing right now? Yes, I am. <laughs> but, uh... Not a session. Yeah. Anyway, I'll let this play while we discuss. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, they are all, and they're all Dutch angles, too. He's yeah. like, the whole yes. time. Yes. Oh, God, now I want to do a shot for shot analysis. There's pinwheels in the back. It looks all joyful, and he just goes right past them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. This is going to be annoying if I just watch this again with you guys, but maybe that's what we, we start off next week. I'll do a little shot by shot analysis of this one. Yeah, we should do a, we should do a, we, we we should do a fan track of this film. Oh yes, please. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Let my voice recover, and I'm in. I might have to sing along. Just deal with that. Okay, we have like five minutes to do Spirited. Yeah, let's talk remember. about Spirited because we have fully five minutes. So obviously, Spirited is the one that is not just trying to do the Dickens story, right? So modulation it, is the word that you modulation. use. Modulation. That's it. I really it's modulated. Like it. Yeah. yeah. It's modulated. So the question, so, so sticking then to the basic question, right? What does the opening show us? What are we, what are we getting from this opening shot? Um, I had to rewatch the opening because I didn't quite remember it. And it just made me laugh because it does rely on our entire core knowledge of knowing what the Christmas Carol is. It yeah. doesn't explain anything. The ghost of Christmas yet to come pointing skeletally at the tombstone. Right? Yeah. And somebody <laughs> yeah. named Karen kneeling in front of it. Like we all know what that means. 
Um, but then that is immediately cut by having somebody at coffee, please. You know, and at coffee is swooped in by an assistant. So we're on a set and there's a PA there and you're like, Ding. Yes. So showing us the business side of the Dickens world is such a fun spin on and this we idea. Get, yeah. And, and we get the narrator voiceover, right? Yep. Um, telling okay. us about who turns out also to be a character. So we have like the integration in the world, but we get, uh, we get the voiceover narrator. Um, and, um, and he emphasized, right? The point is change, right? Change is there in the business of change. And so it points immediately to what we were talking before as like the core, uh, element of the Christmas Carol story, right? So it pushes us all the way up to that. Um, we get a sort of funny parallel, right, of um, uh, the Scrooge description, right? Um, so, I mean, you, when, when you think about the opening of the book, the death of Marley, emphasizing the death of Marley, Marley was dead, right? Um, and the description of Scrooge and how... Um, you know, wrenching, grasping, and covetous he is, and his uh, chilling uh, of the atmosphere around him. Spirited does play on both of those things at the it very does start. In a, in a very different way. Because in a very different a way. Yeah. So, like, by start, because st it's true that starting with the, um, the skeletal ghost of Christmas yet to come, pointing at the tombstone makes us think of not only the book, but all the other movies and everything too. Um, we, um, uh, it's also like we're talking about death, right? We start with death at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and then like Marley's death, um, though there's a comical reversal, right? We see her sink into the ground in front of her tombstone and the narrator immediately jumps in to say, don't worry, she's going to wake up in her bed just for, like, she's not dead. Right, so there's yeah. this comical re reversal of the death of Marley at the beginning, um, and then when she does wake up, and we see her coming out, you know that uh, that scene, which I think is shot really well, of the the neighborhood all out playing hockey in the street, uh, and uh, and the ball rolling into her yard, and then her boot stepping on the thing, and everybody gasping and freezing when they see her. Um, the way that she has this chilling effect, right, on everybody else, like 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 Scrooge did, um, you can see them putting her in that role and kind of pointing to that element, though though they're not talking about the character of Scrooge. Um, yeah, you get that other moment. You get that community turning against them. Yes, yes, but of course, the thing that's uh, so different about this film is that we're distanced from the whole thing, right? Um, because those two things, so these elements from the story are being explicitly tied to her character, right? Like the emphasis is that this, the story of A Christmas Carol is being replayed here in this modern context. We're just coming at the very tail end of that, right? We, we yeah. don't know her story. We, we didn't begin at the beginning with her. We're beginning at the end with her, though it's picking up those things from the beginning. But the whole time, from the, with the voiceover especially, and then, as you say, particularly then forcefully in the scene, when especially when the ghost of Christmas yet to come drops out of character, right? Yeah. Um, and starts speaking the way that he speaks, <laughs> right? Um, it, it distances us from... The, the 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 sort of internal narrative of uh, of of her Scrooge like trajectory, and it separates her in a different way too because she's not important. We're watching yes. we're watching the Scrooge like character, but it doesn't matter. She's just this year's test subject. You know what's important is the story that's happening on the side to her. So she's just the lead character this year, but it could be somebody new tomorrow. What's important is how they're getting that story told. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, one little detail that I didn't appreciate because I was watching it for the first time the last time we talked about this was 
how they did that freeze frame thing when she's going yeah. out, she hits the ball and then she goes out into the road. Um, like they, they do the freeze frame thing and they talk with her while everyone else in the mortal world is frozen. Right. Um, and then she resumes into the flow of time and immediately gets hit in the head with the ball, right? As an anticipation of the getting hit by the bus at the end uh, of the film in the, yeah. under exactly the same circumstances. Um, that, that little foreshadowing was kind of fun. And of course, I didn't know enough to see it the first time I saw it. But. And, and I like that moment for a different reason of like when the music starts to swell, when everything's frozen and you see the, the spirits and everything come out of the distance, mm -hmm. it feels like a musical number. It yes. feels like a show. So we're very quickly in a production um, and we're not in a morality story about somebody fighting their heart. That does happen, mm -hmm. but it's very much about the production. So yes. it's just immediately reframing our expectations. So we kind of know the story we're going to be told, especially after you're introduced to Ryan Reynolds and what a jerk he is. You're like, ooh, something, mm -hmm. something's going to attach here. Um, but yeah, I don't think you get that at the beginning at all, like you do with the other Christmas carols. It's like, yeah, there's this thing that we know you know, so we're going to play with that. But we're going to show you the production behind it. Right. right. And that seems to me to be also a turn on what Dickens is doing with his narrator as well. It's another version yep. of like they they go to a, a, another entire level of saying, yeah, this whole story is being orchestrated. Right. We're going yep. to take you behind the scenes. But behind the scenes is a musical pr production itself. It's, it's, right? Yeah, it's a totally different behind the scenes. Yeah. Totally different behind the scenes. But again, there, like, it's when you go behind the scenes that all of a sudden a very Broadway esque musical number breaks out and they're all commenting about how, like, the afterlife is a musical. And, oh, uh, yeah. And they're all very self aware of it, of like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of dancing in the afterlife. <laughs> Deal with it. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I found that very, um, I found that very interesting. Um, but again, the, the, the way in which they sort of emphasize the manipulation of the story, like the framing of the story within, you know, as a deliberately staged uh, story is um, uh, really draws attention, I think, uh, to the, the narrator. And even in a sense, uh, the whole Christmas Carol caroling thing that we were talking about, the, what role that implies for the story that we were discussing earlier on. Um, yeah. Man, there's a lot more to say about Spirited because it's a very interesting film. But looking it's at the opening, that was the way that they both connect it, but also really, I obviously yeah. disconnect it by starting at the end of the story instead of the beginning, right? It's uh, there's, there's an almost explicit reversal while, you know, trying to, trying to, to, to point to that core and even picking up some of the elements from the from the original descriptions. And still emphasizing the need for that narrator frame and the feeling of other with the Scrooge. So like I feel like when you start talking about Spirited, you're like, oh, it has nothing to do with the original story. It's such a great, you know, departure from the original right. story or, or phrases like that. But it does, it has a lot to do with the original story and it mm -hmm. relies pretty heavily on our knowledge of it. Yes. But because of our core knowledge as a community or species <laughs> then right. they do get to play with it a fair bit more yeah um, and it's not until way later that we find out that scrooge is even more of an integral part of the story than we thought but it doesn't rely on that by that point we have so much else going on yeah based on the framework that it, it just works really well yeah yeah um okay so we're running low on time but we'll come back to spirited next week um, maybe we should reverse it and start with Spirited next week so that we don't do that. we don't uh, uh, shove yeah. it into five minutes at the end. And but it's Spirited and it's Spirited that gave you your aha moment last year. For yeah. Next week's theme. Yeah, it was. It was. So okay. So what we're gonna do um, next time? We want to do another Christmas Carol discussion because it's still the holidays, um, and we we want to do. Um, we've been doing this opening series. Which is interesting because, of course, the opening scene, it's worth doing an analysis of an opening scene of a film or the opening pages of a book all by themselves without even doing any comparative element. Right. Like what is being what promptings are you being given? What groundwork is being established? 
what yeah, we, what's necessary for this story to happen like what is the foundation that someone needs in order to engage with a story like that alone is a really cool case study like it is. what do we see first that pulls it you is. in and it certainly has helped uh to to spotlight for me not only some of the things that these different works are doing but the ways in which they're doing to really emphasize the different uh, you know um tools at the disposal of a novelist versus a uh, versus a filmmaker. But what we also want to do, um, and this is the thing we're going to be doing, we're going to probably come back and do this with many of the other works that we've already talked about also later too, is to be jumping ahead and choosing a particular scene, a particular important moment in the story, and doing a close comparison of how do the different do these different versions treat that particular thing? Because, of course, as we've seen, the openings, they're all equally important as openings, but they're often not treating even the same thing, right? Um, so instead, we want to look at a scene which is a, a, a critical moment in the story um, and look at how the different versions, how the book presents it, and then compare that to and to each other how different works to it so what we what the moment we're, we're going to do this with christmas carol next week um and the the moment we want to look at is when scrooge wakes up like that moment of change moment. the moment of change he wakes up and realizes it's still christmas right there's still time and what does he so do from like the, the grave to the end basically yeah. yeah yeah but with special attention to like the earliest part of the sequence, right, from from his waking up forward, um, and uh, and so we want to look at that for the same three films, right? We'll, we'll we'll come back to the same three films, and we'll come back to the book, and we'll look at how they handle that moment. And Phil, it is certainly true that for some adaptations, it might simply include ignoring what is a pivotal scene or downplaying a pivotal totally. scene. Absolutely, that would be that would be one of the interesting things. Yeah. And that's where you come into some interesting ideas from different perspectives of like, well, that one totally messed it up because they dot, dot, dot. And right. obviously with Christmas Carol, it's kind of an easy one for us to look into. And I love that we're doing this kind of broader spectrum look and then a deeper dive into specific things. But think back to some of the works that we've talked about or any of the Tolkien stuff that we could talk about. It's such a great way to case study adaptation. So we've done broad, we've done opening, and now we'll start to do a close reading and we'll have a nice little tight series yeah Love it. yeah and i might have a voice by next week so <laughs> exactly <yes>. exactly <laughs> so back to christmas carol next week we'll look at those scenes uh the scrooge wakes up or the scrooge character wakes up um it's a little more complicated and spirited and spirited we're gonna are we gonna focus on the ryan reynolds character and his moment of of realization yeah. basically yeah. yeah i think he's the most important one in that and yes okay there's many more things i want to say there but i'm just gonna say yes we're okay gonna focus on Great, great. Um, and then the following week is Christmas, so we will meet you then. Yeah. That will be a good be, setup to say Merry Christmas. It'll be literally Christmas afternoon. Day. Yeah, so we're not yeah. going we're not, we're not to meet on Christmas Day. Um, I will be watching Muppets, though. So. There we go. There yeah. we go. Um, I think that uh, my son has never seen The Muppet Christmas Carol, so I think... And you uh, call yourself a father. Well, I, you know, this is why... Uh, uh, Maggie, my wife and I developed the policy of what we call um, uh, compulsory cinematic education, um, yes. which is weekly family movie night where we force our children to watch movies we think it important for them to have seen. Okay, um, so he's quite old and there are 52 weeks in a year. How is this not And we've not yet? gotten around to it yet? Yes, yes. Uh, it's that I'm not trying to say that there is... Oh no blame to be ascribed for our laxity. I'm only saying that there's still time. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> that's true. I'm still appalled. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I have to admit my, my wife is not a huge Muppet fan in general. Um, so. I still love her. Yeah. But that just means she hasn't had her gateway movie and surely yeah. Muppet Christmas Carol is the gateway <laughs> for a Jane Austen fan. Yeah. Her, her gateway to the Muppets was the original Muppet movie. Um, which she always found sad. <laughs> it's oh. kind of sad and depressing. <laughs> it's a little, the original Muppet movie is a little rough. I would start with Muppets and then move to Jason Segel. Yeah. That's, that's my path in. <laughs> yeah. 
Was. Right. All right. So next week, same movies, different spots. Same movies, different spots. All right. Thanks, everybody. That's good. Appreciate Take it. Care, See you guys. next week. Bye. Bye.